Good morning. Well, many people looking at the book of Leviticus might think it is of no real importance to us as Christians. It is just a series of regulations for offering sacrifices and organizing families and all the other things that Moses introduced to the people and the rules and regulations and laws he gave them in order that they, as a traveling nomadic community living in the desert, might be kept healthy. But the truth is, as we look at these regulations, we find that they are pertinent and they do apply to our lives as well. Not just as regulations and laws, but because of what Moses gave to the people, God was able to almost prophesy to the Jewish people and to us as Christians what he hoped to do with his world and how he hoped to bring it to a maturity. When Moses said to the people, you will keep the feast of Passover, they were remembering the time when they were released from Egypt and the blood of the lamb had been put upon the doorposts of their house. But it was on the feast of Passover that Jesus died on the cross outside of Jerusalem. It was his blood which was shed for the salvation of the world. Now, as we look at these feasts in Leviticus, we may not understand why it was that Moses gave them these instructions. But what we have to realize is God is training his people and trying to show them truths which were beyond their understanding. And as he does this, he introduces them to ideas which grow slowly over the years. And so the Jews would gather every year in Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover, and they still gather there every year. And Jewish communities throughout the world gather and remember the shedding of blood, the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of the houses that released them from slavery. But we as Christians as well, remembering this feast, where we thank God for the blood of the Lamb of God, which is upon our lives, shed for us, that we might have eternal life. Now, you may not understand why it was that God chose this particular method for the salvation of souls. And although many theologians may try to explain it to you, you'll soon realize that they don't really understand it either. Because this is part of God's plan, and somehow, one day in eternity, we may see clearly how it is properly laid out. But for us in this world at this time, we just have to accept it that this was God's method and therefore it was the best possible way that he could use in order that you and I might have eternal life. And then we looked at the Feast of Unleavened Bread because the people being thrown out of Egypt had no time to allow their breads to ferment and to become leavened. So they had to eat bread as it was, unleavened bread. And immediately following the Feast of Passover, we have this Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we saw how God again used this particular thing to allow Jesus to lie in the tomb. The women could not go to the tomb on the following day after his death to anoint his body. They had to stay in their homes and they could do no work. And then on the Friday, they would have prepared the spices. Then the Saturday would have come and again they couldn't do any work. So the first time they could get back to the tomb was the day after the first Sabbath after Passover, which the Jews kept as the great feast of first fruits. The first fruits, Jesus rising from the dead, the firstborn of creation, into this new community of people who would have eternal life. And then we went forward and we saw the great feast of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. And again the Jews would be gathering in Jerusalem and giving thanks for the birth of their nation. And again God uses this particular feast to pour out his Holy Spirit. See, these are not accidental happenings. God is using these particular Jewish feasts to show us what he has done. But he also wants to use these feasts to show us what he is going to do in the future so they become prophetic as well. The Feast of Israel look back on those early days, but they also point forward to the future. And that's why it's good to look at them and think about them and pray about them. Now, the early disciples didn't know when Jesus was going to come back. They'd seen him ascend into the heavens. 
They'd seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had given them instructions how they were to take the gospel to all nations. They set about this task. Probably they thought, well, he probably won't be back this year, but he's coming back soon. But of course, what they could never have realized that 2,000 years have passed since those particular events. And we are still looking forward to a future when Jesus will return. The question is, when will he return? Well, we don't know the year and we don't know the exact time. But I have a strong feeling that he will return, not on the first feast, the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, or not on the feast of the first fruits on that Sunday, not on the feast of Pentecost, but probably on the feast that come at the end of the year. Because at the end of the year, the first great feast we have is the Feast of Trumpets. It was the great harvest. And Paul says to us, on the last trump, which was the, the 100th blowing of the trumpet, Paul says to us, at the last trump, the dead will be raised. We'll come back to these feasts again tomorrow. Amen.